Here at Horrible, we're all about giving you what you need, and since all my homemade intros have gone awry, I decided to go store-bought for the time being. X marks the spot on this one. Whoa. Look at this fucking box. So here we are back in my room. The package is safe and secure. Let's get to unboxing this bad boy. Let's see what we got. It's empty. What a rip off. Let's read it together. Oh, come on! We did it! We reached the end of the season! Coming as a bit of a surprise, at least to me, they decided to drop both the last episodes at once. So with a lot to get to, and all the spoilers in hand, this is Slasher Season 4 Flesh and Blood, Episode 7 and 8. For the last time, let's break it down, break it down. So we pick up right where we left off at the end of last episode, with the hallucinating Afra as she laughs through the forest holding hands with the gentleman. Accompanied by a very nice eerie score in the background, the visuals continue to just impress with this really awesome shot of the like kaleidoscope gentleman. You ever frolic with the gentleman? You ever frolic with the gentleman? On weed? The gentleman ties Afra up hammock style in between two trees. Kind of a cool parallel how Afra keeps addressing the gentleman as daddy, similar to how Spencer thought the gentleman was a net when he was all drugged up about to die. And die Afra is about to, because the G-man takes out a hacksaw and just starts. He goes all the way through, Afra gets cut in half, and guts spill everywhere. It's a very artistic homage. The gentleman sees in the remains a finger, I think it's Christie's, and examines it. I only mention it because it really threw me off for like this whole episode, and I thought it was kind of interesting the way they very subtly address it later on. Cut to Liv interrupting Theo in the corpse cooler while he's adding Christie to the ever-growing collection. Theo and Liv go back and forth for a little bit, playing catch-up on all the theories we've already established ages ago. Questioning everybody, and even at one point Theo says, well, how do we even know we could trust each other? He uses this as a smooth guy opening to actually be like, but you know why we trust each other. Then they proceed to share what's probably a top five least romantic first kiss of all time, which Liv hesitantly but eagerly accepts only to then stop because, you know, surrounded by your dead family. Jokes aside, their chemistry is actually really good, obviously. They meet up with Grace and then both sides go through the necessary process of questioning the prior whereabouts. And they find out Vincent took his gun and went to go look for Afra. We catch up with Vinny Sent in the woods as he finds Afra's remains, looks through him with a flashlight, finds a ring, Grossly just puts it on, doesn't really clean it. So Vincent gets back to the house, tells him that he found Afra in the woods in pieces. Grace notices the ring on his finger and goes, hey, where'd you get that? It's Meryl's. Everyone curious as to how she knows that, seeing as she doesn't even know Theo's birthday, starts berating her with questions. Which eventually leads to Grace admitting that her and Meryl were having an affair. This makes Theo real upset and he continues to just kind of go off while she ends up being like, hey man, Spencer not only knew, not only encouraged it, but sometimes he'd watch. He's got a little Cronin kink. Theo says their marriage was a sham, yeah, no shit, and then Grace says most of the good ones are, and then we get a flashback. Annette stuff! Annette is extremely cancer-stricken and basically bedridden, and Grace is her nurse. Basically, Annette says that she feels that her time is running out, and considering she is the backbone and glue that holds the family together, she's extremely concerned that when she's gone, Spencer will destroy himself and the family. She says it takes great strength to be the force that holds that power, and that she sees the strength in Grace. You're hinting that you want her to take over your spot as the matriarch, but it sounds more like you want her to be Spider-Man. Grace tries to reassure her that she'll be okay, but Annette just persists and says, no, you got this. And then the flashback ends. Cut back, and Theo's still coming at Grace. Liv comes to defend Grace, and then goes at Grace, and then Grace comes back at her. It's just Galloway dysfunction, classic stuff, you know? And then the fucking bell tolls. They find the sound coming from what appears to be a 1997 laptop, and then we get our final appearance from Cronensaw. He congratulates them for making it to the penultimate challenge. Too fancy. So this is going to be an intelligence challenge in which each competitor will be locked in a separate room in the basement with the same set of puzzles to complete. First person to finish wins, and the loser, well, we all know what the loser gets. And at that point, watching it, I was like, okay, so he isn't on it, I guess? The twinsies and Liv basically agree that they would like to not compete, considering the boat will be here in nine hours. Grace, on the other hand, is like, this is my kind of competition. I'm trying to win this money. Why aren't we competing? To which Liv logically responds, uh, cause we'll be locked in separate rooms with a serial killer on the loose and we won't know what each other are doing. Side note, absolutely love the lighting in this episode and the use of color within that lighting. Obviously, three outvotes one and three also outpowers one. So they all grab Grace and they throw her in locker in Spencer's room. She throws a temper tantrum thrashing the room and in the process spills an IV bag and the liquid drips and lets her know that there is a secret passage behind the wall. Then as she's trying to 
figure out how to open it, we get the most gratuitous, unnecessary gore of the season. And I'm not complaining. She's fiddling with it, tries to rip something down, and her fucking fingernail rips off, and it, like, made my spine shiver. To which a great comedic moment follows as she angrily just goes, fuck! And she could have just pushed instead of pulled. Classic. Really cool looking shot leads us into a flashback of Spencer on the bed crying about Annette's impending doom. Grace walks in looking like she's about to have a three episode arc in a 90s medical drama and basically tells him, hey man, champ up, Annette doesn't want that. He initially tells her to fuck off, but she comes and sits next to him anyway. They exchange water metaphors about not letting the family drown, and then he goes in for a kiss. He comes 90, she only goes 5, and says, nah nah nah, your wife's in the other room, and then she gets up and leaves, and the flashback ends with her grinning. Cut back to the present with a close-up of the finger gore because it's slasher. That's why we love this fucking show. Quick combo with Theo, Vincent, and Liv about how they're together and Grace is locked up. They should be all good. Cut to Grace in the basement. Grace? Gracement? Grace walks into the challenge room. Cool little set. And there's three puzzles to be solved. She starts with the one on the left, which is a shuffle puzzle of the... Galloway property. She solves it by maneuvering and sliding the picture of the mansion all the way to the top. Some sounds happen and, uh-oh, the walls start closing in. She frantically goes to the puzzle on the right, which is some kind of math, math, math puzzle. I don't know what it is. If you do, enlighten your boy. I was confused just looking at that thing, so thankfully they don't spend too much time on it. Grace solves it and goes to the main puzzle straight ahead. This puzzle has pictures of the family all over the wall, and she has to pick whoever the killer is and place it in there in order to win. Then we get another Annette flashback in which she is feeling a lot better from the chemo regimen and tries to apologize to Grace about trying to make her spider I mean, the, the new matriarch of the family. Grace says, no, 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 you were right, and that Spencer needs a strong woman, and the cancer is making her weak. Annette seems a little weirded out, and she's like, no, I feel a lot better, that was just the fever. And Grace says some wild shit about how they don't do autopsy on cancer patients. Is that actually true? She then makes a statement about how no one's home and since she's in pain and takes a needle of drugs injects her with it, and fucking kills her, along with my theory. The flashback ends, with Grace still in the room and the walls closing in, and then we cut to the three at the table, and Vincent's acting kind of fucking weird. Slams on the table, and he's like, ha, I'm gonna go take a piss. And they kind of bicker, analyzing each other's characters and what level of suspicion that each of that generates. Vincent leaves, and we cut back to Grace, wall still closing in, and she's trying to rule people out. She's running out of time, she's running out of time, she's thinking, she's thinking, and then, oh shit, the killer's not one of us. The walls break the light, it goes out, it's dark, and everything stops. The slot where she was supposed to put the picture of the killer opens with a key, and it says, A key is of no value unless it finds a door. Obvious escape room theme with this one, and it actually kind of gave me vibes of the actual escape room movie with the way the walls closed in. Everyone's reunited in the hallway, and Grace is basically just bragging about how smart she is, and she got out, and she went and played the game, and she won. And then basically she saunters off to go find out which door the key unlocks. It unlocks Florence's art room, which is an interesting correlation considering they had that little spat in a flashback in an earlier episode in there, and Florence also prematurely celebrated, and it led to her demise. Cuts to Liv and Theo in the basement, deciding on whether or not they should go through with this challenge. Vincent comes in, and basically he's like, nah, I got a theory. This theory is actually pretty genius. Grace is the only one competing at the moment, so technically she's not only first, but she's last. So if they don't step in there, she loses. Theo and Liv realize, hey, that actually kind of makes some sense, and realize that if that's the case, Grace is about to be deaded. And so they run up to try to prevent this. Grace walks into the room and sees on the table a bunch of <gasps> gold! It's a bunch of gold bars. Then we get a flashback to what I assume is directly after Annette's funeral. Grace is coddling Spencer and just trying to comfort him about Grace's passing and is basically like, she knew I'd be here, so you know, we're all good. She kind of goes like that and he starts kissing her neck. Cronenberg tries to go downtown and make her Monenberg. The flashback ends before we find out if he actually succeeds. Cut back to the glow of the gold on Grace's face as she just circles it like a shark. After she makes a full rotation, it is shown that the gentleman is behind her. She turns and as her eyes meet, the gentleman charges Grace. Wait a second. A vicious killer protecting gold? <gasps> Secret leprechaun sequel! Grace ends up getting her bell rung by taking a face first dive right into the golden bars. Dung! With gripper things, the gentleman grabs this red hot fucking cylinder full of what I originally thought was liquid hot magma. It's not, it's actually just liquid gold, and the gentleman pours it all over Grace's face. The body twitches really sell it. Theo, Liv, and Vincent manage to break down the door, only it's too late and Grace is already covered in liquid gold, which kind of looks like nacho cheese. Quick flashback of Spencer announcing that him and Grace are going to get married, to the dismay of Florence and the sleigh man. We cut back with a close-up on the good stuff. Now this kill's fucking fantastic. Melted face and gold. A couple of things about this kill. I really, really, really liked it. I thought it was extremely creative, extremely unique. I think the symbolism is pretty obvious here. It's that Grace was a gold digger. So the other cool thing, at least for me, that I found about this is I felt like this was almost an homage to the legendary Frozen Face Smash Jason X kill, which is kind of interesting considering guess who else was in that movie? 
pointless minor tweak suggestion, this episode's called Goldfinger. I think it would have been a bit more on point if you had had the gentleman rip off Grace's eye patch, pour a bunch of gold in that, and then all over her face, but call the episode Golden Eye instead. <laughs> Anyways, they deduce that the killer must be using the passageways because there's no way they could have gotten past them. Vincent also deduces that this means they're all innocent and asks for an apology and gets none. He kind of plays it off and Vincent's really funny in these last few episodes. They search for a second and then they find the passageway behind a wall. I love the red lighting and it's because of this awesome lighting that they realize, hey, this is not old, this is new. They realize Spencer must have paid for all of this and that basically means, yeah, Spencer's in on all this shit. Theo realizes the cables connect to the only other two places with electricity, the boathouse and the bunker, all decide that the bunker is probably where the fucking killer is. So because Vincent has a gun, they decide to split up and cut him off on both ends, which I don't totally agree with, but hey, the tropes are the tropes. I thought the scene where Theo and Liv are traversing through the passageway did a really good job of like building up the tension for the next scene. Liv just kind of snaps into that G.I. Liv mode. And Quick shot lets us know that Vincent is out front waiting as Theo and Liv make their way into the bunker. There's no one down there except for bits of Christy. After I shouldn't waste food like that. There's starving cannibals and poverty-stricken areas all over the world. What they do find is a surveillance system and realize that the killer's been watching them the whole time. They see that Vincent's outside waiting and then, oh shit, the gentleman's behind him and they rush up. The gentleman comes from behind Vincent and they get into a struggle. Vincent fires the gun. It gets knocked away. The gentleman comes from behind Vincent and attacks him with a fucking wire saw. He manages to get his arms up, but they're cutting through. Theo and Liv manage to finally get out of the bunker and help Vincent. Theo's got the gentleman with the wire saw, but the mask is preventing any damage from happening. The gentleman manages just to get away and then Liv kicks the gentleman, gets up, has a little stare down with the three of them and is like, this shit ain't fair. Later. Takes off. They decide to split up again, which this time, nah, I don't agree. Why would you do that this time? You don't have the gun anymore. Also find the gun. Cut to Theo and Liv in the house searching. Liv finds some blood on a pillar, meaning that the gentleman's probably there somewhere. And then we get a really great sequence. The gentleman's running into the room in slow motion. The whole scene's in slow motion for the most part. Liv interferes saving Theo and then gets knocked to the ground. And the gentleman's about to end her. But then Vincent's entrance music hits and he runs down the ramp into the ring and by God, what a spur! He came out of nowhere! With the gentleman laid out on the ground, everyone's like, take off the fucking mask. They do, and the moment we've all been waiting for, it's... It's fucking Trin! End of episode. Before we forge forward face first into the frenzied finale, I want to give some love to a couple members of the Detective Collective who in some form or fashion nailed this Trin prediction. So Unowen, Ollie Bailey, Alex, David H, and Kolik, hats off to you, my friends. They predicted that shit all the way back in episode 4. Alright, episode 8. Explain yourself. We open with enough foreshadowing to cause an eclipse that leads up to a smiling familiar face. It's Patrick Garrow. G Garrow. He played Tom Winston in season one. This is a Trin flashback as seen as she walks in in some top tier threads. She's pretending to be a fan of the artist that Patrick is playing who like crushes stuff I guess. She's a day early for the exhibit and then proceeds to start lightly flirting with him. When he turned 50 he realized he doesn't care about her and then changed his whole life. The crusher catches Trin's eye and she lures him over there. And then she obviously ends him with a very, very visceral, very satisfying head crush. Trin is very giddy by this result, to the point of even sticking her fingers all up in the brain mush. Which explains that last minute little deflection they attempted when the gentleman picks up the finger and is looking at it. Why that finger? What's important about it? And there's nothing important about it. Trin just really likes fucking gore too. Back to present day, and we get a classic tied up antagonist interrogation slash motivation explanation. To summarize, she was paid and Trin loved it. It was Spencer's game, but she got to dole out the punishments as long as she left one heir. Liv asks why she killed her mom. Good question. Trin just says it was a juicy opportunity. Trin is slapped, knocked over to the ground, and is able to break free. Then we get the rare match that's actually not scheduled for one fall. She gets Liv onto the ground and is choking her. But as we learned in the last episode, three is greater than one. And the match ends when Vinny nails Trini in the head with a chair. Guess it was a hardcore match. Better watch your back, Vincent. That belt's on the line 24-7. And they securely tie Trin to a pillar. Theo asks Trin, were you ever actually an end-of-life specialist? Fuck, they told us from the jump, didn't they? That's good wordplay. Spencer dug around in her past, found a mal practice suit, and was going to use her on retainer as a killer, like Crumbopulous Michael or some shit. Spencer gave her a test to rid him of a pest, Ray Kraft, the artist from the opening scene. This actually turns out to be O'Keefe's father, meaning the her that he didn't care about turns out to be Florence. Of course Florence would fall for a guy like that. So then we get the much needed and anticipated explanation of the wood chipper situation. That was actually Meryl's body that Florence eviscerated in the wood chipper. This whole explanation is mostly done in a series of flashbacks, which unfortunately means for Meryl, I believe his guts passed him up on screen time. 
This also shows us that Trin was having herself a fucking blast with a huge smile on her face as Florence was chasing her with the axe through the woods. And we see that she was just kind of holding herself up inside of the wood chipper while Meryl's body went through the ringer. So it's no real secret if you chatted with me in the comments or noticed I always left her out of the suspect list that I wasn't really stoked off of this potential outcome. Totally what I get for getting her name wrong my entire first breakdown. But I really only had two main hangups with this theory. Number one, which they actually answered. Why did she do that to Spencer? She's a sick fuck. All right, cool. And the second is that I really just felt that was a bit too much happenstance to really plan out that thoroughly. She antagonizes Florence just enough so that she snaps and chases her through the woods with an axe that is her mind but then doesn't and knocks her to the thing. And note, super cool retrospective detail pointed out to me by Jennifer Alice. Just like how Florence faked out Trin in the wood chipper situation, she got Florence back when she pretended to let her go free from the art project and then hit stuck her right back into the prongs. And despite that it's all out of love, totally get that I'm absolutely nitpicking here. But a quick post-flashback exchange and I wouldn't be tripping in the least bit. How, how did you know Florence would chase you all the way to the wood chipper? Ha! <laughs> I didn't! I just threw that old chunk of meat in there because I knew it would come in handy at some point. Okay, I'll stop campaigning to get them to let me help with season five. All that being said, after sitting with it for a little bit, I actually really fucks with this though. Because Trin doesn't really matter in this situation. Trin's just a surrogate killer for Spencer, who's the real main antagonist of this entire season. And the fact that the gentleman is based off the family ghost is really symbolic, kind of how the ghost of Spencer is actually the true killer. And that's why we really only get that bit of Trin backstory right there at the end, just to show that she's one sick pup. Speaking of backstories, Trin has one more ace up her sleeve in order for her to avoid jail time or getting killed. There's dirt on all three of them with a lawyer that will go out to the public where it'll destroy them the most if she doesn't come and present an heir. Vincent, I guess, killed somebody during a riot in prison. Liv covered some shit up in Iraq. We don't know what Theo did yet. Vincent's had just about enough of this shit, and he grabs a knife, stabs Trin 19 times, including one to the jugular. The definitely dead killer does not come back to life for one last scare. Vincent says, fuck it, the shit was going out anyway, and then the bell tolls. Really poetic shot of the sunset behind Trin. They eventually find the bell toll coming from a meat freezer. Open it up and, oh, there's Spencer's body. More like Cronin, Berg. But it's not actually cold, it's warm, which makes the smell very unpleasant. The prosthetic looks really fucking great. There's three knives on Spencer's body and a tape's note. The note is a line from Macbeth, which Vincent is able to decipher and analyze. It's basically all about having guts and doing stuff you don't want to in order to get what you need. They find the giant acid hole in his chest and they realize that this is a challenge. They grab dead Vid Cronin corpse and they throw him on the kitchen table. Vincent and Liv have a rough time trying to convince Theo to dissect their grandpa like he's a frog in a sixth grade science class. They ask Theo what his dirt is and he deflects by just saying that there's no way that anyone will believe that they didn't kill everybody. Vincent and Liv power through and begin what is the final Slash Viber challenge. Feels like a nice nod to Fear Factor. After some stabbing, slicing, and searching, Vincent's stomach starts to get a little weak and Liv handles it like a champ. The entire exchange is probably like when any of us try to get any non-genre fans to come watch some horror with us. Liv sensibly suggests that they split all the money since they all earned it, to which Vincent says, nah, I'm here for it all. That is, of course, until Liv finds the colon and squeezes out his Cronin turds. Vincent runs back out in the living room, puking up, and Theo's kind of making fun of him a little bit. Some verbal jabs lead to a full-blown argument. Vincent says they hated him because they were always comparing him to Theo, and he was the fuck-up. Great cinematography as Theo snaps, grabs Vincent, throws him between two pillars. And Theo says that once Vincent got kidnapped, those roles reversed, and they hated him for not being Vincent. Super underrated dynamic in this whole season and could be a movie on its own. Vincent's just done with it or something gets set off and then he pulls out a knife and starts chasing Theo. Theo ducks Vincent by hiding in one of the hidden passageways, only to give away his location by making a noise and getting stabbed through the wall a couple of times. The chase continues in a very well shot scene through the hidden passageways. Kind of reminiscent of people under the stairs, I love it. He gets like a crawl space, Theo manages to knock the knife away as he gets to it, we transition to a flashback. Theo and Vincent, his kids, are playing around in the crawl space. They overhear Spencer yelling at Florence about Vincent. He's saying that she needs to be a lot more strict on him and that he's an embarrassment and a danger to everyone. Theo seizes this opportunity, crying out for help, and then says Vincent was strangling him. Spencer's had enough of this shit. Grabs him out of the hiding spot and starts slapping the fuck out of him. Flashback ends as the brothers meet eyes and Theo's kind of grinning like clearly solidifies Spencer's decision to get rid of Vincent. The kerfuffle shuffles back into the main room as Vincent gets a couple more slices in as he continues to blame Theo. Theo says he was scared of him that they were just kids. He ends up getting the upper hand by getting a sleeper on him and bringing him down to the ground. Knowing Vincent won't stop until he kills Theo, Theo grabs the wire saw out of his pocket and... And he saws. He saws until he turns his twin brother into the death animation for Pac-Man. And Theo's mouth gets filled with the fountain of blood pouring from the head. 
undoubtedly a contender for best kill of the season. I'm a sucker for a half decap. R.I.P. Vinny Sent, he died trying. Sure enough, look over and Liv saw all of it. He was like, he was trying to kill me, and Liv's just like, yeah, I could see that. Very well done, very well acted scene between Theo and Liv. Theo, looking like Beverly from It Chapter 1, starts to come to the reality of all the stuff that's happened. He's clearly in shock, and Liv luckily is there for him to calm him down and reassure him that no, he's not like Spencer, and that he's actually a very good man. Another beautifully shot scene where Liv and Theo take a shower together as they wash away the trauma from the weekend. Liv says they're free, they share a sensual kiss, and then they get down. Finally, some guts get got in and no one got got. But Longo, aren't they related? Yeah, but they're so damn cute though, who cares? Exhibited by the following scene where they have a very realistic, very genuine post-coital conversation. Despite the boat only being an hour away, unfortunately, the sweet scene shortly turns sour. Seashells on the seashore. Liv says they have to find whatever Trin was hiding in Spencer, and then tension slowly builds as they decide who's actually going to do it. Whoever finds it would technically be the winner of the will. Theo says that he believes Spencer wanted him to take over, despite Liv arguing that she's a Galloway too. Theo's concerned about how the specifics will actually work out in the real world. But he also offers to marry her. But Liv doesn't really want to get married. And if she did, she sure as hell doesn't want to be a Galloway. Theo's being very subtly manipulative, and she dons a face similar to when her GI Liv switch is flipped, and then she goes, well, when you put it like that... <laughs> She has him come lay between her legs and then says sorry and shit. Theo then says, well, if you're going to be my wife, you got to know everything, and then volunteers what Trin has on him. So Theo had had a few and uh, crashed his car into a daycare center. Spencer got him out of it by paying off the poverty-stricken parents. Liv's face is no longer one of sympathy and understanding. And then Theo asks, what did you do? She goes, oh, what did, what did I do? <laughs> Liv invokes the spirit of the praying mantis. It is a slow and very realistic neck snap, which I very much enjoyed. After doing the difficult, dastardly deed, Liv proceeds to start the cleanup process. She takes Theo's body out to the woods, and we finally get to see the true magic of the wood chipper. Great shower of blood. Back in the house, Liv does the necessary adding and removing of fingerprints. She returns to Spencer's body and angrily sifts through all his parts. She eventually finds a capsule up near Spencer's throat. In it is a rolled up little piece of paper. Liv has the will. Ecstatic and exhausted, she makes her way out to the dock. She sees the boat in the distance, everything finally hits her, and Liv collapses. Flash forward several months later to a now pregnant Liv in a scene with an interior designer as they go over her ideas for the makeover of the house. The interior designer is a fun little cameo from the director of the season, Adam McDonald. She ends up saying she's thankful she's having a girl because she's not sure she could love a child that looks like Spencer, Theo, or Vincent for that matter. Which Adam replies with the perfect line, blood is so hard to get out. As she slowly moves around the table, she launches into a monologue about how she can't imagine that mixture of love and hate and what it could make you do. As she symbolically takes her seat at the head of the table as a dramatic score builds. And the season ends on a great exchange of shots as we go from live to the family, to live to nothing, back to live as she is the last remaining Galloway. Whew. All in all, I felt it was a really appropriate way to end the season, fuck everybody but Liv. I also feel like The Gentleman was definitely the best killer this show has had so far in all four seasons. Not only did I really enjoy his aesthetic, but his kills were definitely the most brutal and the most creative. I have what I think is a fun idea for an uh, end of season video, so I'm not going to get too in-depth of my final overarching thoughts, but I'm sure all of you have a lot of thoughts on these last two episodes and I would love to hear them, so let's get to chatting. Keep an eye out for that video in the next week or two. Until then, let's keep uh, hoping for season five, because if we don't get one, That'll be horrible.